of me and Nazat are going to be talking about the art of communication, which is really a skill that um, everyone will can help in you know, developing in terms of their relationship with their spouses, their partners, uh, and any relationship really with um, parents, with children. Um, what we will discuss today can be implemented in any relationship, but particularly we're, we're focused on um, spousal relationship and uh, communication in a marriage. Um, but it can be used in um, any of our close relationships. Um, as we go through this, we will we we like to keep it interactive, and so we will have some reflection, um, kind of pauses, and um, times where we would like you to introspect and really look at what um, your life is bringing in in terms of communication. Um, so we we'd really appreciate if you keep it interactive, and um, both of us are uh, like. For others to talk, and we don't like to talk that much, but um, inshallah, we can keep this interactive. Um, so we like to start off with kind of grounding and setting intention. Um, a lot of times we're coming into these talks and these uh, events from all over the place and, you know, rushing or something. Um, and really starting out uh, with setting the next hour or so with grounding ourselves and you know, taking a deep breath. Um, doing some mascar and um, you know looking at our five senses and kind of grounding ourselves and bringing uh, us to where we are right now and being present and then setting intentions for, for what we hope to gain um, and learn and uh, take with us for um, the next hour. Um, so I'd like to invite everyone to whoever is joining or whoever is starting this to just take a minute and pause and you know, take a deep breath or um, set your intention um, for this next time, this next hour, inshallah. Mm -hmm. So um, this is our roadmap for today. We're going to go over what exactly is communication, why is it so important, and uh, what we need to do to learn about it. Um, we'll go over different types and styles that um, there are communication, different research, and um, also kind of talking about what we've learned from, you know, there are stories with, from the prophets, from the Quran and Sunnah, what it takes to have effective communication and what it takes to break communication or barriers and obstacles to communication. And then we'll leave a part at the end where there can be questions and uh, discussion, inshallah. Um, with that, I'd like to pass it to Nuzat so that we can start with what is communication. So what is communication? And I think Faiza and uh, Sabrina have already kind of covered this. Communication really is the basic building block of our relationships. Um, it's how we communicate our thoughts and feelings and connection, and most importantly, connection to one another. So we're talking a little bit beyond the, can you pick up dinner or can you pick up the kids, right? We're talking about a deeper level of communication in which we are actually connecting with one another. And having good communication skills is really critical for, sex, for successful relationships, whether it be with your spouse, siblings, children, or your coworkers. So let's start by looking at types of communication. There's verbal and nonverbal. Verbal is basically the language that we use, right? What we say. Nonverbal includes facial expression, posture, eye contact, gestures, tone of voice, body language, and so forth, so far and so forth. Um, so let's take an example right now. Um, suppose um, a family member has come home from, from a long day. They walk through the door and they shut the door a little louder than they normally do. Walk into the living room, throw their backpack or perhaps their briefcase onto the ground and plop really loudly down onto the sofa. And they have their, eye, their eyebrows are furrowed and um, you know, seem very tense. 
And you walk up to them and say, uh, how was your day? How are you? And they look at you and just say, I'm fine. Right. So there is verbal communication going on and there's also nonverbal. And are you really going to believe that they're fine? Even though they verbally have said they're fine, their body language has communicated something entirely differently. And so various studies have been done on communication. And one that is often cited is Dr. Mehra Bians, which um, he concludes that communication is comprised 7% of verbal, you know, verbally what's said, and 55% is body language, and 38% is your tone of voice. And even, you know, even if we're not watching someone looking at pictures, we also do infer things, right? Like, so take a look at these birds. When you look at them, what are thoughts that come to your mind about what is maybe being said or what they're thinking? I know when I look at it, I'm thinking the front bird is not wanting to share whatever he's eating. And the one in the back is like, hey, did you, you know, did you save some for me? Those are thoughts that come up. And we all make inferences daily uh, on what we see. So we can move to styles of communication. There are three styles, uh, passive, aggressive, and assertive. So passive communicators often um, they devalue their own needs to the point that they allow others, um, they'll uh, meet other people's needs at the expense of their own. They might keep what they're really thinking and feeling to themselves unless they know that the other person's thinking the same way. Generally people who um, have a dominant passive personality, sometimes they low self, have low self-esteem, um, and often they uh, let other people's needs come before their own. So aggressive, the aggressive communicator will try to get their needs met regardless how it affects the feelings or goals of the other person. They may take over a conversation, not seek input, and constantly challenge any ideas or feelings that don't uh, align with their own. Um, aggressive behavior taken in extreme can look like violence. Um, insults and threats. And a third form of communication, style of communication is the assertive communicator. Assertive communicators, they value their own needs and are able to express their needs to others and at the same time, respecting the needs of others. Assertive communication often indicates high self-esteem and self-confidence. And the effects of assertive communicators, the effect they have on others is that they elevate others as well and they have strong relationships. I want to also just kind of mention, sometimes we, we might have a dominant way of communicating, perhaps we're an assertive communicator, but there will be times where we decide to be passive and, and that's okay. So one style is not necessarily better than the others. I mean, we hope that we um, are more assertive in the way we speak and that we value what other people are saying, but there are times and perhaps if your rights are being violated, we might get a little aggressive. There might be times where we take a passive stance just for the sake of a relationship or keeping a relationship that we're in right now. Um, as long as we do these things with purpose and intention, it's okay. All right, so. Sorry. <laughs> moved a little faster than um, I was planning. Um, so examples of communication. Let's think of a scenario. There's a couple who have, uh, who have accepted a dinner invitation and um, spouse A really wants to go and is looking forward to this uh, invitation, this dinner, this social gathering that's going to happen. And the day of the event, spouse B comes home and says that they're really, really tired and they just don't want to go. And so look at, let's look at these different styles and what the conversation might look like. So if spouse A was a passive communicator, they might just not go. Um, they won't say anything. They'll keep their disappointment to themselves and they just won't communicate their needs. If spouse A was an aggressive communicator, they might say something like, I've been waiting all week to go to this and I'm going. You can do whatever you want, right? If spouse A is an assertive communicator, they might say something like, I understand that you're really tired right now. I'd like to figure out a way that both of our needs can be met. So right now we want to take uh, a minute. So we've learned about different styles and different types of communication. 
And to really internalize this, we let's take a moment and think about our own upbringing. Let's reflect on our childhood. What kind of communication patterns um, did you see in your family of origin? Okay, and I'm just going to pause for maybe a minute just for you to reflect. How were things said? As you're thinking, think about how were things said? Did people have different styles of communication? What need, how were needs communicated? What were phrases that you might have heard? So as you were reflecting on this, kind of how was it for you? And did you notice anything about yourself? Very often, we subconsciously repeat patterns of behavior that we saw growing up. And so we hope that one of the things that you walk away with is being more conscious and intentional in the way we communicate um, and not just automatically maybe um, uh, use those unhealthy patterns that we've subconsciously adopted. So I'm going to hand it over to Sabrine, who's going to talk a little bit more about effective communication. Thank you. So, um, from your reflection exercise, I was just thinking of, um, I was reminded of one scenario that I remember someone talked about of how their um, mother used to give them silent treatment when they were upset, and they hated that. But when they got married, they kind of repeated the same pattern when they were upset with their husband, but they, and they were, they were upset with themselves for repeating the pattern, but they didn't know how to break the pattern, but it was just like a cycle that, so it's interesting with how family of origins can really impact the messages that we receive and how we still communicate them. Um, so Sabrina, I just wanted to chime in and, um, I guess I'm one of those people who also goes kind of silent and quiet. Um, how I, I hopefully think I've gotten better about it, but sometimes I just find it's sometimes easier to deal with the situation if I just go completely quiet. But I know that irritates my family. So how do we, how could we possibly break that? Or what, what is, what are the best things to do to, um, to, you know, like I said, to break that cycle and, and be better about communicating and not going quiet. Right. What would you we're, we're actually going to talk more you about. <laughs> right. We are going to talk about. That's a great question. Is it's it's not necessarily like you know, and as I mentioned, that there's no good or bad, and to really read the situation and respond. So it's not necessarily bad when we go silent. It's just the intention and the purpose behind it, mm -hmm. and so. Really quickly, we'll dive into it probably later too, but really quickly to answer what you're saying is that um, why are we going silent? Like sometimes when we're going silent, is it to just take the time to process how we're feeling and how we're upset and then to communicate that to our partner and not having a really long period of silence, but just to you know, communicate to our partner and say, you know, uh, right now I just need time for myself to just process. I'm really upset right now and I just need to take this time and you know I'll let's talk in an hour in two hours and you know we'll come back together but just so they know that you know this is what you're doing this is how you're processing and that this is what you need right now and it's not um it's not harming them as such but it's just uh helping them understand you better in terms of what your need is at that time so it's okay to take that silent retreat um for yourself so uh, it's kind of changing and reframing how to approach the action and the behavior, but also not making it like three going three days with silent treatment. And unless you do what I say, <laughs> then, then I'm going to talk to you. Right. So, yeah, I, if, you. I don't know if that very helps. Helpful. Yes, very yeah. helpful, Sabrine. Thank you. Yeah. And I have actually, just sorry, um, I have in the Facebook chat that if anybody would like to pose any questions, I should go ahead and do that. I'll be checking that. Um, and so I'll let you know if there are any questions that come up and I can and I can communicate those over to you. Absolutely, absolutely. We love to have this interactive. So Perfect. Um, anything that comes up, any anything that people have from Mizzet's reflection as well, 
an introspection kind of exercise. Feel free to share and stop me or pause me. Perfect. Will do. Um, so we learned, as I described beautifully, kind of the, the types and styles of communication that different people have and different personalities may have and how our personal histories can impact those um, things. Um, Faisa, you really described how you take the silent treatment, how that can impact your family and how they can get upset. Um, but having effective communication, there's a lot to understand ourselves and understand how our personal history can really impact um, the way that we're perceiving information and the way that um, we are giving information. So like with the silent treatment example, um, say someone uh, has been treat has been you know raised with silent treatment as a form of punishment for doing something wrong as a child or something. When they are faced, they're in a marriage and they have you know the husband go silent for a while and not respond. And the husband might be stressed at work or something, but but might be silent and not responding. For them, that might be triggering some really. Um, hard emotions, um, thinking that they're upset, uh, you know, the wife or, you know, it, it could be reversed. I'm using the example of wife and husband, but it could be reversed where the wife might be giving silent treatment and the husband might have been raised as that might be something that um, was troublesome uh, um, as a child. But really to use those as a guide and um, following what, what our world and our uh, communication might look like. I think you can move to the next slide. So we'll go more into depth with each of these um, kind of factors and aspects that um, what of what it takes to really have effective communication. And um, I think we talk about understanding the communication style and different types of styles, but we'll, we'll go a little bit more in depth about um, communication styles and how that might be different for different people and different um, circumstances. Um, so the first part, I think you can move to the next slide. Okay. Um, the next part is really understanding ourselves. And it might be strange to start with this because a lot of times, I think especially in our community, sometimes we're like looking for answers on how to, you know, really tell someone what we're trying to say. But really understanding ourselves is the foundation of communicating effectively. What are our triggers, our personal triggers? How is it that we are perceiving information? And that's why when we started this presentation, as I talked about introspecting and um, understanding the styles and um, having the different styles and types of communication. So really being aware of how we personally um, are responding to situations or perceiving situations. Um, a really interesting example, I, I don't know, it just came to me, but uh, uh, once I was meeting a friend for coffee and I was holding a lot of stuff in my hand and the my friend just texted me and said that uh, I'll be there I'll five minutes late. And I had a lot of things in my hand, so I just texted back and said K instead of OK or, you know, OK. I just said K. And I responded. And then her response was, are you OK? Are you mad? And I was like, yeah, I'm OK. And then when she came, she was worried that, you know, is, are you OK? Are you mad at me or something? And I was like, no, I'm fine. And then when we talked about it, for her, that K uh, was like, you know, someone's really upset and they're just not taking the time to respond. Okay, but that K uh, was just like a, okay, like you're late and something. But for me, it was just that I had a lot of things in my hand and I just had to like get the message across as best as I could. And so even while we're verbally communicating, I think in this world we have, you know, communicating via text, via email, by social media, um, we have a lot of factors, but just being aware of what's happening in ourselves and how we can respond to um, the triggers that we personally have and not projecting them. Um, I think in this social media world, we have a lot of um, a lot of images that keep coming and a lot of comparisons that we might make 
to other people, other marriages, other couples, other friendships, and other um, what others have, you know. And and that art of comparison is taking over the art of communication, um, which really impacts our personal relationships. Uh, what we need to understand is that that is not reality. What what we see on social media, that is not a reality. And that people are posting just like a little snippet, a, a little window. It's just like, you know, right now, the three of us are visible probably on screen, but we only have a window into where we are in our space. And um, comparing that to someone's whole home and someone's whole life is uh, really unfair. Um, so, com and comparisons lead to expectations, which really is um, uh, one of the silent killers of relationships because we start to expect and then we start to get disappointed when our expectations are not met. And then that leads to anxiety, that leads to just anger, that leads to resentment, that leads to bitterness. And it, it's just a cycle. So, one of the things of breaking that is to really find happiness and contentment within ourselves. And the fuller that we are, the happier that we are, and the, hap the more contentment we find with ourselves and gratitude, the more we're able to give that. And, um, you know, as our cup is full, we are able to give that to our partner and um, express that to our partner. Um, looking for external validation. And looking for that validation from our partner can also impact our way of communicating to our partner. So if we feel content, we can nourish ourselves and then also give to our partner nourishing words and nourishing understanding. And then um, in that, the communication kind of flows and, and it becomes more of a, you know, we versus I. Um, and again, uh, you know, living in an individualized society, there is a lot of, you know, this is this is what I deserve. Um, it, it becomes a lot of like a, a me kind of idea, like you know, me, my myself, myself, and I. And it becomes focused on what is it that I need. Um, there's a whole lot of self care, but there's not a lot of couple care. Um, and so there's a balance that Arlene teaches us in all aspects. Um, you know, humble up or having the teachings of Islam because Allah really teaches us how to be with ourselves and as individuals, not to take abuse, not to take, uh, let people take advantage of you, but also to give kindly, to respond generously, um, to uh, speak with each other in, um, you know, the, the verses that come to mind are some, you know, even with talking to parents, Allah says, you know, talk to them in a noble way. Um, and, and, you know, those are relationships that are intimate and that are um, very close and, and it's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to get really um, upset with each other. But Allah reminds us again and again to really take into account and um, be generous with our, our words and be kind with our words and be merciful. He is our Rahman. And so he is um, forgiving to us, I think. Just the the way that Allah teaches Musa al Islam to when he's going to Faran and how to communicate with Faran with respect, and that is one thing that really we miss out on relationships is to have respect for each other and to see each other as humans. That you know we make mistakes. Our husband can make a mistake. Our wife can make a mistake. Our children can make a mistake, and to allow that we can be human in terms of that um and so in as a couple having a team attitude you know this is what our needs are as a couple this is what my needs is, are for myself as an individual if they don't match how do we work together to make sure that our needs as a couple are matched and our needs as an individuals are matched and how do we uh, understand that for each other So one of the tools to understanding each other, and I, I love this tool because it, it comes up so much in terms of how um, grounding it can be for people to understand themselves as well as um, each other. And that's the five love languages that um, was developed by Gary um, Chapman. I love the little image too, because it's like the bird is like shocked that, oh my God, I'm getting 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but these five love languages are are really they they describe how a person can perceive love and how um, a person can give out love. So, for example, you know, words of affirmation if a husband keeps saying to his wife, "I love you, I love you," and and that's you know him expressing his love, but the wife doesn't feel love because she's there doing the dishes while the husband's watching TV. I'm being very stereotypical. It could be the other way around. <laughs> it could be the wife is um, watching TV and the husband's doing dishes. Um, but, you know, the wife is like, okay, you say you love me, but you're just sitting there while I'm doing the dishes. And so for her acts of service where the husband gets up and helps her with the dishes or helps her with the kitchen might be her way of, um, you know, uh, knowing love or feeling loved. And so recognizing where our spouse or a partner, you know, the relationship around her, how they feel love and um, receive love is important, but also how we ourselves are um, feeling love because oftentimes we're not in touch with that. Uh, And I know when I, there is a website, if you you search uh, the five love languages, you you go to a website and you can take a quiz where it would, uh, you know, answer, you can answer different questions and it'll show you what your, primary love languages and then your secondary love language so that you can recognize it for yourself and that actually can change over time too so at different points in different situations there might be different uh, love languages that you need Um, so you know receiving gifts might be like having a special name it doesn't have to be expensive it doesn't have to be um, I'm forgetting all the top brands (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to be prior, but it could be something small, right? Like if you went out and, um, you know, you see a really cute little pen. I love pens. So, um, you know, you can you can bring that for uh, if you know that your spouse or someone loves pens or, you know, loves something really small, you can bring something like that for them and um, just for no occasion or something like that. But Having that time with each other and having um, to understand the love languages, I think uh, the Prophet ﷺ was really good at understanding people and understanding how they feel noticed and they feel like seen. Um, And that is basically what this is, is when we're looking at the love language, the need that people have is to to feel seen and to feel noticed and to feel like, you know, oh, this is, this is something that my spouse noticed about me. This is something that they really um, are communicating to me that they love me. Like if, if someone um, is upset and what they need are, is a hug or you know holding a hand, that's physical touch, that's their love language. And so just giving them that, and it's, it's about understanding the other and not making sure the other like feels understood. So, so it's, it's about, a give and take, right? We we work both ways, and that's that's how relationships work. It's it's coming together and working together for both. So this might bring out some <laughs> um, some questions and some 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 feelings um, amongst people, but. Research has shown that men and women have different ways of communicating and different ways of really experiencing um, how to communicate and, and, and different things that work. So, for example, for men, they um, and again, I'm, I'm going to preface this with saying this might not be all men and this might not be all women. It might be switched around, um, but this is just what the research has brought about. And and so to really look at yourself and say like, okay, you know, I this this is not me. Like as as a man, like for example, the, the shoulder to shoulder communication. A lot of times, men they prefer to be side by side when they're opening up or having intimate conversations or really expressing themselves. It, for them having that shoulder to shoulder, even teenagers, I would for every anyone who has teenagers, that research has shown that teenagers prefer. So when you pick them up from school and you're driving side by side or you know with your spouse where you're driving side by side, those might be good opportunities to have conversations. Um, 
because that's where they can feel more open and can express more. Versus women like to have face to face where they feel like that's more sincere, that's more relational and intimate, and you know, you have your full attention. Um, and, and it can be reversed too. So it might be that, you know, sometimes women prefer to have that side by side and, and that's how they open up. But um, what generally what research has shown is that women are more relational. They they like to have those intimate conversations and and be able to sit and have deep conversations face to face versus um, shoulder to shoulder. And that women like to go into feelings more. They'll they'll try to tell the story, and a lot of times men will get frustrated and think they just get to the point. What is the point to this? Um, and you know they, they, they go through the whole nine yards and then get to the point but that is an important tool for the, for women that is how they are expressing themselves and you know for men to understand that can be very liberating because for them they'd be like well, why, what was the whole point of that and then you're just telling me that you need to get gas <laughs> you know that's that's the whole point but Men will just come in and say, you know, the facts, and they they'll just um, be focused on that. There's there's a really interesting and funny video online of um, how the men and women's brains are structured, and um, he he talks about how men have boxes, and they they can retrieve one box or one tab at a time, and that's. That's what they're focused on. And there, there's, I, I still don't get there because I'm a woman, but there's a nothing box. And and they can sit there and be, ta- be thinking about nothing. And I, I don't get that because I can never think about nothing. But um, it is true. They, they do think about nothing. And um, I mean, mashallah, that, that's a really good skill to have to be able to do that. Uh, versus women have multiple tabs open and they're wired and you know subhanallah that's how Allah created us and Allah created us this way to complement each other not to compete with each other and not to um you know to to make those comparisons that you need to be more like this or you need to be more like that it's just understanding each other and then um having to face the 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 challenges of communication but helping each other to overcome that together think we can move to the next this is sorry just yeah this is just so interesting just um the, the previous slide with regards to the style of communication and, and 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 of course how their brain is made up and how our brains are made up and um you know it's it's um i think if we were to look more into it and um, try to grasp that i think communication i well could could get better i guess right <laughs> um i've heard about the side to side whereas I, I as you were saying as women we like to be face to face so eye contact right and and so i've noticed that when i've have tried to have those conversations eye contact you know i'm i'm kind of focused but like you said my husband or my my teenager will just kind of look away or um so I guess I need to do more shoulder to shoulder um, communication with them. But um, that, that's really interesting. Just, just kind of just breaking it down and um, just kind of visualizing and seeing that, um, that, that that's very, very helpful. I think. Yeah. I think just understanding the differences, it takes away the judgment yeah. aspect of it. Cause a lot of times you walk away going, Oh, they're not interested in what I have to say. They're not looking at me because that's all. Right. That, like, yeah. Face. Yeah, and so it alleviates a lot of hurt if if we can move to understanding. Sorry, let me get it back to you. No, no, absolutely. I think that's important. I think um, you know what, what you're both saying is understanding. Like, you know, if 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 you were to have uh, a conversation with your husband, you wanted to have a serious conversation to implement the side to side, and and you know, if he wanted to have a conversation with you, or you prefer face to face, for him to notice that and you know, have it face to face. So also to, what, to understand that and then to um, come together. And, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and I think oftentimes we just get caught up in the heat of the situation and don't understand it and it gets frustrating. But to know that, you know, there is a biological component to it. There is, um, there's a personality component to it. And, and that's, it, it's nothing 
against the other person it's something personal it's just a, a way of coming together um and, and to give it a positive spin i think uh makes it better sometimes involving humor can help um that's why i love that video of the uh different things so now like you know sometimes when i'll ask my husband what are you thinking you'll say nothing and we'll laugh about it because <laughs> you know he's thinking, thinking about nothing <laughs> <laughs> and I still don't get how that happens. Baby. I know. I'm I'm still trying to work my way around that, but I'm definitely going to ask my husband that question. <laughs> I, it, it is and I, and I've asked him to teach me that skill because I I, I, I feel like it, it's a helpful one. <laughs> absolutely. It's nice not to be able to have to think about anything, right? right, right. Like you said, we're always multitasking, there's always something that we're thinking yeah. about. There's just yeah. never a moment where we're not thinking about something. Yeah. Um, but let us know what the magic answer is to that, Sabrine. We'll <laughs> keep us posted on it. <laughs> I will, I will. If I find out, I will. And if anyone else finds out, yeah, I know, please share. <laughs> yeah. well, some of that is functional. We have kids, and you know, any parent who's at home with like kids running around, you are thinking about what, what each child is doing, and then you have to do your home, you know, you're you're doing your cooking and your cleaning and you're multitasking, right? And women tend to do that generally, not always, you know, um, tend to do that a lot. So it makes more sense that we can keep all these boxes open because we are attending to so many different things. Right. And Marshall, I mean that like my husband appreciates that he's like i don't understand how i how you can keep tabs of all of these different things that are going on and you know still show up to all of them so they're all skilled yeah <laughs> um so part of, like a, a lot of what we're discovering and like learning is you know the different the different components to how each person and each individual is and as a couple how communication can be and so being intentional in our communication is the key aspect of um you know bringing it all together it's kind of like the big um overarching thing of of how to bring all of this communication together is to really be intentional and mindful in our communication considering what the appropriate style might be um you know in some occasions I think those have mentioned this being passive might be better than uh, being assertive and that might be more helpful in the relationship um, at that moment um, you know for example if one spouse is really upset really upset really heated up and you know the other spouse also starts matching that um, with being heated up it's it's going to miss um, miss the whole point uh, one of the basic needs, uh, I think Nosa mentioned this earlier, is, you know, having connection with the other. And one of the basic needs for being connected is feeling safe. So feeling safe to be able to express yourself, feeling safe to commu- being able to communicate. And it goes back to the brain where our nervous system actually, when we are heated or we're, we're triggered, um, our brains are not, um, I think people have heard of a fight flight response to uh, trauma mostly but it it is a way where if someone's triggered their brain is literally like um you know if it's like this it's flip the lid and so they're not in a safe zone to really comprehend what you might be trying to communicate and trying to say even if you're saying the right thing it might not be registering as such because they don't feel safe to communicate and um you know that safety is 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 something that is intentional and built into a relationship between uh, a husband and a wife and i i always feel like it's um you know the, the, the example of the prophet sallallahu where when he was given the first revelation and the the first thing he he felt scared he felt like you know what 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 is this he didn't know it was a, a big unknown and the first thing he did was he ran home to his wife and he was very vulnerable at that point and you know, he didn't know what had happened. He didn't know how she would react, but he felt safe to communicate to her that this is what I just experienced. And this is, I don't know what it is, you know, and that safety is built over time and that trust to be able to come in and know that, you know, your spouse is not going to judge you. Your spouse is your safe zone and that your spouse will be able to hold you in those times where you feel vulnerable or feel like, I, you know, you need to really communicate something that's so um you know such a such an experience that you might have and you know 
I think our families need to learn how to have that holding spaces and homes and, and being intentional and mindful of that. Um, Cause we we're looking at it again, more and more we're seeing how, you know, people are going out to friends and to other members and communicating to them what they're feeling versus coming home and uh, expressing that to their own family members with whom they might um, feel something or, or want to work something out. And, you know, nine times out of 10, when I work on these situations and I, I work with families, uh, a lot of it is like assumptions that are built up and we'll go into assumptions that, you know, if I tell my mom this, or if I tell my husband this, they're going to react this way. And a lot of times when it actually comes down to a situation gets worse and then when they actually sit down and communicate, you know, the reception is actually really well. And and they say, well, why didn't you tell me before? Why wouldn't you communicate? And so the family unit, um, it's, it's actually called triangulation when I think when the person goes out and expresses to the other person versus coming to the same person. But what's happening at the family unit is there are a lot of other voices that are filtering in and that communication then um, gets lost because you, there's a lot of noise. There's a social media noise. There's like, you're going to your friend and asking for advice, but having proper trusted spaces and holding spaces and then going to the proper resources to really, you know, figure out what's going on and, and making that um safe place to be able to talk to each other to be able to express and to be able to be your own individual self but also um, help your spouse be their own individual self and then come together as a couple and define yourself in that way so considering appropriate styles considering the different layers of what's the right time what's the right space or what's the right language to use um like there, there might be times where you know the husband is really stressed at work, and the wife is like, you know, he's not paying me any attention. And and the and the and usually men when they're stressed at work, they don't really communicate because they're, they don't they might not communicate about feelings. But also like they, it it matters on how safe they feel to communicate the feelings. So it might not be the time to bring up, you know, something that the wife has been uh, wanting or something, but to really notice what's going on and tune into that. You know, one of the things I like to say is that um, for, for a husband and wife and for families, we want to create spaces where we provide ease for each other and not difficulty. And so being sources of ease and sources of, um, you know, safe zones and, and holding each other uh, and being mindful of that. And, and all of that can really be centered on Allah. Uh, I mean, Hamdullah, we have a really, a really rich religion that that when we center ourselves with Allah and center our relationships with Allah, it's actually very liberating in terms of, you know, what would Allah want me to do in this situation? I really feel like I need my husband to do this. Um, and I need to tell him that. I need him to know that this is not right. And that's right, it might not be right, but how would Allah want me to address him, how would Allah want me to um, tell him this? And, and the same thing for a husband. I don't want my wife to be doing this. And, and um, you know, a lot of times these things come up with financial things and uh, different arguments. But you know, how would Allah want me to address my wife? And, and knowing that, and being mindful of Allah, and centering that relationship in that can make it more intentional, make it more effective, make it more impactful, and make it full of barakah and mercy you know we we heard the verse um the verse in surah room where it talks about how there's mawadda and rahma between uh that, that allah made you know uh pairs with each other i i won't quote exactly i'm forgetting this out but i thought there's mawadda and rahma and you know oftentimes we just take that for granted okay we're getting married and Allah is going to give us mawadda and rahma, but it takes work to maintain that mawadda and rahma, and it takes both people in the marriage and in the couple unit to really work on that mawadda and rahma, and that's that's with the communication that we're having with each other in our presence. Sabine, just um, just kind of backtracking with a couple of things that you've said, um, 
you know, just as, as men, I think the generalization is that men don't tend to communicate as much or don't express their feelings as much. And if they're having a really stressful time at work, um, you know, uh, they're not really expressing it or they're expressing it in, in, in different ways. I mean, how do we, um, you know, provide those tools for them or how, how can they become, I guess, better at expressing their feelings or communicating? Um, I'm, of course, I'm, you know, I, I have a teenage son, mashallah, he's getting older and I want him to be able to, you know, empathize and, and, and be able to, you know, eventually when he has his own relationship that he should be able to talk about things. If he's stressed about things, he should. How do we kind of empower them or how do we teach them? Um, I know a lot of what we've said before, it's kind of part of your nature or how man is made up or how a woman is made up. It's the makeup of, of, of them, but I'm just wondering how, how can we, how can we help in that area to make them better communicators or for them to be able to be more expressive with their feelings? I think that's great. I don't know, Nizza, if you want to take that first or um, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we can brainstorm. I'm just um... no. It's a great question, and and I think the first thing that comes to mind wow. is really looking at the person in front of you and seeing what would work. Um, you know, for your son, it might be different. For your husband, it might be different. For my brother, it might be different. For you know, my husband, it might be different. For my cousin, it might be different. But literally looking at the person in front of you and seeing that, and and one of the the, the things that I a, a, a great tool that we have, you know, all this Western psychology and all of this, it's brilliant and it really helps. And it, it, but Islam has given us a lot of diverse information in terms of that too, with the different companions and you know the different prophets and uh, the Sunnah and the Quran and and you know there is such a diversity of personalities with the companions with the prophets and and what they were given and so helping them relate to uh, those power figures really and seeing how they um, manage and how they express their emotions you know in the quran allah talks about like even the prophet saying you know um when will the help of allah come you know so they, that is really expressing emotion that they're they're really reaching a point where they're desperate and they, they need help. Uh, the companions, you know, the, the difference between Abu Bakr's personality and Umar's personality, and both are good, both are okay, both are needed. And so looking at the personality of the person and, um, you know, giving them that acceptance and validating them in that way. And then when it comes to teaching about feeling and expressing, I think really modeling um, is a lot uh, of what we can do in terms of um, showing that, you know, this is normal. This mm -hmm. is, it's normal to express feelings. And when they do, to really take it in, to sit in and take it in. And it could be a little thing like, uh, you know, Mama, I really want to have French toast today. And, you know, just being like, oh, I'm really glad you expressed that. And not, not making it a big deal out of it too, but also like, uh, appreciating that you know oh you really want to have fr a french toast and it, and it starts young um and that's helpful but it, it can at any age if you give someone that validation and that you know normalization of expressing feelings i think that we are wired to learn and um incorporate that i don't know if that helps answer what yeah, absolutely i know i of course my mashallah what can i say they're very expressive <laughs> the man oh, no, my, no. Of my family <laughs> but um but i do hear this a lot like my five I, I think I speak about my father. My father wasn't very expressive, you know, with his feelings. And so, and, and I hear this across the board that, you know, men generally tend to keep their feelings in or don't tend to express themselves. Or if they are going through something at work, they don't tend to say. It could be honestly just to protect their own families just so that they don't worry them in a way, mm -hmm. right? But then some of them just kind of internalize so much that it can lead to other things. And so I was just wondering, I, I just like how you said it, like just start modeling it, start saying that it's okay to be, express yourself, just tell me how you're feeling, you know, and sometimes it comes to some more naturally than others. And um, it, it, it's good to hear that. So thank I you. I think generally in society, we need to normalize um, men. Like, it, you know, when when boys are younger, they're taught don't cry, boys don't cry, you know, things like that. I think generally in 
the the bigger community and we have to normalize and the prophet saw solemn cried and he he named crying as a mercy you know from Allah so it's it's normalizing those emotions normalizing that this happens and, and this is just part of being human and and in different times it might be different ways of hearing even anger you know anger to a certain degree anger at injustice is a normal emotion and how we channel that is just how um it is and that's that's the beauty of islam is that Allah teaches us about emotions, grief, anger, and, and, and they're all talked about in the Quran, grief, fear, anger, all of these emotions are talked about, uh, and they're normal. It's just how we channel them and how we cope with them and how we communicate them to each other. Perfect. Thank you, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and, I, and I think you've mentioned it. Um, creating those moments of uh, opportunities to communicate. And uh, something that is dying that I keep finding out as I speak to more and more kids is that people don't have dinner together. You know, just that sitting around a table, having a conversation, modeling for your children what it's like to talk about your day, you know, how it went, highs and lows. And uh, it, it just really saddens me because the more I speak to kids, I'm finding out that everyone needs at different times or they have screens in front of you and all of that. And so providing these moments, intentional moments of connection, you know, people think, Oh, you know, we all are living our lives and we're all busy and we all have all these things on our mind. And of course we're talking, we're communicating with our spouses. We're asking who's picking up the kids and, you know um, you know, what do you want for dinner and whatever, but that's not intentional, meaningful um, communication that promotes connection. And I think we just really, really need to be conscientious of doing that more with our kids. And, not not only providing that opportunity, but really monitoring our reactions. A lot of times kids bottle up because as parents, um, we react to what they're saying, right? Instead of like, like just keeping our own emotions in tune, we react in such a way that we create an environment with the kids all of a sudden don't feel safe. Right? And we do it with our spouses and we do it with our children. So just being really mindful of that. And we're gonna talk about reflective listening in just a moment and maybe look at some skills to do that more intentionally. Perfect. Thank you for sharing this. That's sure. very, very important point. Thank you. So we had a lot of information uh, in this little first um, a little while ago. So we're going to go back to our reflection exercise. And um, we've all had moments in which we felt understood or not understood. So take a moment and think about um, a conversation in which you felt heard and a conversation in which you didn't feel heard. Um, and if you could, as you're thinking about that moment, recalling that moment, think about what did the other person do or say that made you feel heard? Or what did the other person do or say that maybe didn't make you feel heard and made you shut down? And how did you react to each? And what were feelings that were coming up for you? So I'm just gonna give you around 30 seconds to think about it. I'm going to check in on the Facebook chat and see if there are any sure. questions and any reflections from what you've just asked as well. So I know um, things that I've heard or that have come up for other people is they'll say, you know, I bring something up. And, and we all do this in which someone tells us about a hardship they're having. And then we recall a time that we've had the same thing. And our intent sometimes is to show empathy. But what we ended up, we end up doing is making it all about ourselves. It's, oh, I, you know, when that happened to me, this is what I did. And we might do it with the best of intentions. But what we've done is just invalidated what the other person was saying, right? Sometimes we just kind of, um, and so people sometimes walk away from that conversation. And I know I've had that experience where I felt, well, okay, it's not about me anymore. It's about you. And, and I've, you know, just gone silent and listened to what they have had to say. Um, how about either of you have any experiences in which you maybe did feel heard or didn't feel heard? I mean, just coming back to what you're saying, there's about certain people making it about themselves sometimes. Um, I've, I've noticed that a lot. Um, and yeah, when you're trying to express something about what you're going through and suddenly, like you said, it's just, and I had it 10 times worse, you know, <laughs> and it right. will become like, you're like, 
okay, I'm, yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, I'm not just not getting what I, what I was hoping for, the support that I was hoping for over here. Um, so yeah, just thinking about that. Yeah, but there are, of course, there are multiple um, incidents where I'm trying to think of some, but I let Sabrine chime in while I, while I think of, while I think of some. Um, I, I just remembered I recently did a training for new therapists that were um, starting at the school district and you know one of them shared a time where she did feel heard and it was interesting so she said that uh she just lost a friend one of her friends had just passed away and she was in high school and uh she went to the school counselor and all she did was cry and the counselor just let her cry and so it's not even saying anything but allowing that space to just be heard and cry and she said that you know now she's in grad school and she's being a surfer that and that was a high school experience but she still remembered it and so I think that impact of just carrying someone in their pain and just sitting with their pain um, is a really powerful way of being able to yeah. you know as a therapist as you were saying um, it reminds me of when I was in school I was in grad school and um that was one of the most powerful lessons I learned. You know, we were role playing and uh, my partner was uh, telling, uh, you know, something really personal that happened and I chimed in, right? Or I had something to say. And uh, the instructor really, as a therapist, it was one of the hardest skills to learn to, to not, you know, sometimes we chime in, we want to make the other person feel better. And it's, uh, you know, it was let the person sit in whatever they're feeling and more will come out if you allow that. And it really, it's difficult. It's, it's easier said than done. Um, but it's important to build that mindfulness and give people their space. My professor used to say, walk the path of pain. And yeah. I thought that was really <laughs> like whenever, Yeah, you're with, the, with your and you just choose to walk the path of pain. And, and I think that is our, our thing is we want to fix it. We want to make it all better and put a bandaid on it. But you know, so we could feel good, right? If yeah. All of a sudden it becomes about us and not right. that they maybe just need to emote and just get it all out, but mm-hmm. we need to feel better. So we, we want to just put a bandaid on it and, and move on. And you know, uh, Stefano, that's what the prophet Sassan did. He, he walked the path of pain with people. And- right. And just, um, just coming back to like, when I did the domestic violence training a few months ago and have interacted with sisters since, um, just meet them where they're at, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I, that was really important to, to hear that. Although it, I don't know, though it may sound simple, but it, it really is like Mazit was saying, it's, it's very, very difficult. Like, mm-hmm. also once again, you know, just kind of meet them where they're at, listen to them and, you know, try not to chime in and give all this advice. And, and because sometimes it's just so easy to, to give all this advice and, and think it, you've, you've made it better for them. But in some ways you may have made it worse. Mm-hmm. So, you know, don't be judgmental, um, meet them where they're at and yeah, just lend a good listening ear, I guess. Um, so that's something that I've definitely learned with the training and, and just speaking to martial experts like yourselves. I, I think it's really, really important. Um, it's a very, diff- it's a very, um, it's a very important skill to have. Right. Mm-hmm. And um and to learn. So um, thank you for those reminders. So this is a great segue into our next slide, which is really about reflective listening. And, you know, as we're talking, it, it just reminds me that, subhanAllah, we have two ears and one mouth, right? So perhaps we should be doing twice the amount of listening than we do talking, but somehow talking is just so much easier to do. And I remember a friend saying that, you know, subhanAllah, we talk and say things so easily, yet we have two gates. We have our teeth and our lips, right? And those those should prompt us to keep that shut and keep our ears open. However, we do a lot more talking sometimes than we do listen. Oh, wow, I love that. Yeah. Very true. And it really is a skill that we want everyone to walk away with today. Simply put, reflective listening is paraphrasing and restating both the words and feelings of the speaker. In reflecting, in reflective listening, we attempt to reconstruct what the other person is thinking and feeling and to relay this understanding back to the speaker and then checking for accuracy, making sure that you've understood what they're saying correctly. Um, and the effect of this strategy often is that the um, speaker feels that you're really trying to understand them and understand what it's like to be in their shoes. It also encourages the speaker to continue to talk 
and to share their thoughts. And sometimes when we do that reflection piece, it, it also allows for speak to reflect on their own words, having it, you know, they hearing what they said helps them to kind of process it a little more and may perhaps sometimes in a different way. So what are the components of reflective listening? One is presence. Our very presence needs to communicate attentiveness. And, uh, you know, subhanAllah, um, when you hear stories from, you know, all these speakers about the prophet and the sahabas, when they were talking to him, they all felt like they were the most, while they were talking to him, that they felt they were the most important person in the world to, to him, right? He made them feel so heard and, and, um, and with our bodies, and especially these days, we need to try and do that as well, which might mean putting away our phones, right? Putting them in another room, hopefully, turning our bodies and our eyes and our faces towards the person that we're speaking to, and with our very presence and body and being, making them feel that what they are saying is important. So the next component of reflective listening is kind of paraphrasing, and we talked about this just a bit ago. It's reflecting back to the speaker what you just heard and checking for accuracy. It builds openness and empathy and acceptance. Um, next, what we want to do is we want to clarify the implicit. And I think we've we've spent a lot of time talking about how a lot of times that nonverbal communication, um, we make inferences, we have judgments, and you know, all of us, our reality is really our perception, right? And, and so we look at things through our own lens, and we want to make sure that we have made, uh, we haven't projected our own thoughts and ideas onto the person, you want to check for clarity. Like if we're reading into some nonverbal behavior, you want to just, you know, kind of check in with, you know, I'm just uh, noticed that you seem, your expression seems a little angry, you're angry right now. We're just checking in, we're not just assuming. So we want to clarify those things that are implicit. The last thing we want to do is reflect back those core feelings. It's really important to kind of restate important thoughts and, and, and feelings. Um, and we, when we do that, we just want to be cautious that we're not overreaching and maybe projecting that, you know, you, maybe you, sh you should what you, that we think they should be feeling. But we want to really just limit ourselves to what we heard them say and what, what we, um, you know, and just really what they have said that they are feeling or thinking. So those are some um, reflective listening skills that we wanted to leave you with. Oh goodness, I sorry, I just all right. So um, there's some principles of effective communication. Um, so we talked about listening, which is definitely more important. And so, of course, actually, when communicating, there are some principles that um, really help in. Um, and this is taken from Marshall Rosenberg's Nonviolent Communication. And there are four things that you want to take um, into consideration. One is that you want to observe um, when we're communicating, if there is a problem, you wanna just observe and state facts, information related to the communication. What is the info that's being presented? Looking at, you know, looking at it just objectively, just presenting the facts. And then we want to move to feelings. And first and foremost, um, we want to look at our own feelings. What's coming up for, uh, for me in this conversation? And I think Sabrina talked a lot about the importance of seeing, um, looking internally and being introspective and knowing what you're thinking and feeling. Because very often when we don't do that, we end up being very reactionary and we end up speaking from our emotions and our feelings rather than really responding in, in a way that, um, that promotes understanding. So we want to understand our own feelings and the feelings of the person that we are speaking to. And third, we want to communicate our needs. What needs are coming up for both parties? What do I need and what does that person need? And then finally, taking those three things into consideration, we want to make a request. So let's go back to the example of the couple that we talked about early on when there was this party that the couple was invited to and one, one person was really looking forward to going. The other party was just tired that day. And so stating observations is just, you know, we have a party tonight and it seems like we have two different, you know, we, we're having... Um, we're not on the same page on this. Um, I really want to go when you don't. You're stating your feelings and um, acknowledging perhaps that one person, um, what are the needs coming up? One person needs to stay home because they're really, really tired. The other person really needs to go because they were looking forward to it and they had all these 
plans for going to this party and connecting with people. So based on that, you want to put in your request. So maybe the request is, um, you know, I acknowledge that you are really tired and really not up to going, but I really have wanted to go and been looking forward to this for quite a while. So is it possible that perhaps um, I go and make apologies or can we go, you will go and you come back early and I'll get a ride from somewhere else and stay longer. Right. So you want to state the facts, state your feelings, needs, and then put it in your request. Um, so what we're going to do next is look at some examples of this, just some tips and reminders. Um, so when we were talking about look, uh, describing things objectively and just presenting the problem as information, um, saying something like you were 20 minutes late for picking me up this morning, that's just objective information, but saying that you were really un uh, unreliable, well, now we're assassinating someone's character, right? We're questioning their character. So we want to be really, when some, a problem arises, we want to be really cautious of, of how we state things, stick to the facts, what happened, right? Let's not project um, our feelings or, um, uh, you know, or like question someone's character. And then next, we want to be genuine. Not only do we want to be genuine, but we want to show empathy and right and be compassionate and merciful. Some of the things that um, Sabrine had mentioned earlier. And I really have uh, recently realized the importance of showing empathy. So in, I work in the school district and I work with middle school kids. And one of the lessons we try to teach is effective communication, right? And anyone who's taken um, marital counseling or what have you, one thing that they teach is making I statements. And so we put these concepts, the four concepts of nonviolent communication, we give them a sentence then. It's usually like, I, um, I feel when... I need, right? So we're, we're, we're kind of encouraging them to state what they feel um, uh, when, you know, what happened that made them feel that way and their needs. And so, you know, middle school kids, you know, they can put you in your, it's very humbling to work with kids because they will find the loopholes in everything that you say. And so one statement that a, a student came up with was, I feel really angry when you act like an idiot, I need you to go away. And so um, I think it's really important that we, first of all, I no longer teach I statements for several reasons. One is that, and Sabrina mentioned this early, that we need to go from an I to a we, right? Very often in conversations, we are really, um, we're focused on getting our point across, right? And we need to focus on understanding rather than being understood. So when we phrase our when we phrase our uh, sentences, be very conscientious. Like be genuine. This kid was being really, really genuine, but he wasn't being very em empathetic. So that part of being merciful. Well, this is your family member. This is you know we're talking about spices, spouses. So this is the person you're going to be living the rest of your life with. So be kind and gentle, and and quite honestly, you want the other person. You know, wanting the other person to win. Um, an argument is probably a really good way to, um, it's something to remind yourself to be humble. And even though uh, very often we think that we're right, I think it's really important to have that place in your heart that you question that and, and, and remain curious. And even though you think it's right, keep your heart and mind open to the possibility that perhaps there is something this other person has that I'm just not seeing right now. Um, so communicating equality. And that is, um, you know, making sure that uh, you're recognizing the other person um, might have a different opinion than your own, right? In that I understand that you have a concern, right? So you're, you're putting them on equal footing instead of saying, how dare you question what I did? Or this is what I said we were going to do. Keeping an open mind and heart, and I think I just spoke to this, is that be sure to keep your mind and heart open. It, uh, we need to be humble. Um, for our own for our own betterment, and um, keep that possibility always uh, open. So, with that, I am going to hand it over to Sabrine to look at barriers to communication. Before I start, that I actually was reminded of something from what you were talking about. You know, that the other person might um, have something significant to say or something. There's actually a blah. And I'm forgetting the exact words, but there's a law that, you know, if, if truth um, 
is on my like if I am speaking the truth and let it flow to the other person or let the other person on but if the other person is speaking the truth and let it flow to me and open my heart to it and I think that I, I thought that was a really I love that though because it, it really shows it really humbles you and it, it really says that you know the other person might be speaking the truth and it might be me that's not understanding or you know and if it is me that's speaking the truth and to um you know take that tool of dua and really expand it and Absolutely. It, and even if we don't need that thought what i really what i really find powerful is when you are disagreeing with someone and you're in that moment and you're feeling really angry to make dua for the other person right yeah. right and 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 just it just opens hearts yeah it opens your own heart i think prophet musa as well i that dua i just say so much all the time the it's such a beautiful it's like it's on my chest with assurance and it's it's all about communication yes yes i'm trying to not from my tongue so that they may understand what i'm saying and you know it it just opens those doors and i think that it's actually nice i went to barriers because But it just aligns your thought process. It's just right. it's amazing. And once again, you've referred to the Quran and Sunnah and du'as, mashallah, are so powerful, right? Mm-hmm. But just in that moment, right? You know, I know we want to be mindful and we want to say the right things. Like you had the, you know, the the crosses and the ticks, and it just, you know, it's all about how you phrase things, right? Absolutely, how it comes out. Does it come out wrong? Does it come out right? And you intend to to say it right, but it comes out wrong, you know. And so. <laughs> So we rely on duas as such, but how do we, and, and I, I'm assuming we, we're coming on to the barriers to communication now, because as much as we are well-intentioned, um, I speak for myself, there are times when, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going in, I've read the dua and I, it's just going to, it's going to be fine. And, and I, I can, I can say this is going to come out right, but you get caught in the emotion and the moment and you think, okay, you know what? Yeah, it's just it didn't come out right. It, you know, <laughs> it's just all gone too far, you know, so I mean, what I know there's no magic answer to this, but just preventing that from happening, um, how do we do that? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'd say one of the magic answers to that is that we cannot always prevent that from happening and that we will make mistakes and that things will not flow. You know, this is right now a presentation, we're going through it, but you know, when it comes to the reality of it, uh, we're all human and there will be those moments where, you know, even with me, I've, I've learned all of this, but sometimes, some, you know, all of that goes out the door and I'm just like, <laughs> I'm <Right. human. laughs> you know, I, I, I will make mistakes and, and recognizing that, as, yeah. as, you know, that that will happen, but then how we recover and how we repair from that. So right. I, we'll, I think I'll talk about conflict a little bit, but a lot of times we think conflict is, you know, it, it, it will make the relationship worse, but it can actually transform the relationship into a healthy relationship because conflict of and uh, cannot avoid it. I, I'm very conflict avoidant, but um, you know, I'm increasingly Allah keeps showing me that you cannot avoid conflict right. and you, you know, can agree to disagree, right? I think uh, right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and I think what you said earlier about being well intentioned to recognize that all of us are well intentioned that the you know when we're coming together and speaking to our spouse that, that there is always that well intention that not to think the other person is really out to get you or like wants to harm you but but knowing that they're they're coming from a good place and that um, meeting together in that point and meeting them where they're at like you said perfect thank you yeah so barriers to, we can move on to and, and, and that will uh, move on to you know some of the challenges that we do face uh, in terms of barriers and um, these are just uh, some that this is John Gottman and I think Gottman is um, a lot of people have heard about Go- uh, the Gottmans and they did a lot of research for several years and their um, research actually provided with 90% accuracy on how they could predict divorce and how relationships could end uh, and these are the four um, they call them the uh, the four horsemen to the apocalypse because this would uh really predict the end of a relationship uh and and the four categories were contempt criticism defensiveness and stonewalling and, and these are behaviors that a person might practice and and again you know we've, we've covered where we come from and all but recognizing that 
you know, where a person comes from and how these behaviors can be in a relationship. Um, and the, the point is that the, if someone is practicing, these behaviors are present in a relationship, recognizing them, acknowledging them, and then working on making them better to have a healthy relationship. So there are antidotes to these relationships. It's not if someone is practicing criticism that that's it. That's that's the end of the relationship. It's just knowing, okay, this is a barrier. This is an obstacle. This is something I need to stop doing. This is something I need to communicate to my husband or my wife. Um, or, you know, my in-laws or my mother that, you know, I, I, this is something they need to stop doing. And then how do we work through that? Um, so criticism is more attacking the personality of a person or attacking the person. And contempt is more attacking the entire self and, and doing it in a more, um, like, uh, like being superior to that person or, or feeling like, you know, you're superior to that person. Like, you know, how, how do you, think you can do that or like you know just demeaning the person mocking them or or really looking at them like that's why I like the image of the bird because that's kind of like you know I am high and mighty and like you know how do you do that and criticism is something that I think we see a lot in um, terms of like you know how could you do something like that like are you stupid are you this and just saying those kind of things that really attack someone personally and one of the ways of really combating that, and we talked about words of affirmation, is really to look and appreciate a person for things they cannot control, like their personality or the way that they look. And, you know, Allah gave us these looks and personality. And so, you know, saying something sweet or loving to your spouse and creating that environment of affection and love and, um, you know, being that, that helps to kind of kick criticism out of the way. Um, and if it is present in the relationship, then to really monitor and, and, and look at ourselves in it. Um, defensiveness is kind of victimizing yourself. So if someone says, you know, an example like, oh, did you pay the bills? And, the you know, the husband might just be asking the wife, you know, just casually, did you pay the bills? And she might be like, oh, my God, like, why didn't you pay the bills? You know, I was busy and, you know, it's your fault. You didn't pay the bills. You missed the but just acknowledging it and sometimes saying, you know, oh, I'm sorry, it was my fault. I'll be more careful and just um, helping that along. And then stonewalling is, um, I'm trying to kind of go through these fast because I think I'm aware of the time. Um, and stonewalling is literally um, shutting down and um, it's like talking to a wall. And oftentimes, uh, I think if you go to the next uh, slide, oftentimes that occurs as a result of flooding which is where you throw all of this information, you're having this, this kind of uh, nervous system breakdown where you're flooded with all this information, you're just going to shut out off mode and you start to stonewall. And with a lot of flooding that can actually become like second nature. So whenever someone brings something up, it's just like a wall and, and you just kind of ignore it. And that, that kind of leads to a very unhealthy environment in terms of being able to communicate and being able to work through things. Reactivity is one like walking around eggshells around a person and, you know, um, being afraid that if I say something, they're going to react. And so just keeping that in. Um, oftentimes flooding occurs with that too. Like when you keep something in, you keep bottling it and you keep stuffing it in and then the dam just opens and and you flood someone with that. And then, you know, they stone start begin to start stonewalling and then you feel dismissed and it, it just escalates into more and more. And then assumptions and misreading is a really poignant verse in the Quran that says, uh, I think it's a Surah Hajrat where it says, um, avoid suspicion. Um, suspicions, you know, it, it can be a sin. And, and that, you know, in, in terms of our relationship too, we we need to stop assuming that this is what our husband meant, this is what my wife meant, you know, in misreading situations. Um, there is this concept I, I meant to talk about earlier, but, you know, having emotional bids that, you know, a, a husband and a wife can make and to uh, really listen into that and, and not, um, and, and, like, engage in that, so not turn away from it and, and to turn towards your husband and wife. And, and oftentimes when, Someone might say something, might assume that they're acting on this uh, because of this, but to clarify and to understand where the person is coming from so that we avoid misreading the situation, misreading what 
there and crying and really aware of the time. I'm sorry I rushed through that, but it's a mistake. <laughs> um, but that's kind of um, what we wanted to cover. You know, it's uh, there is a lot that goes in Korean. There's a lot that we need to practice. And, uh, you know, there are obstacles and challenges, but alhamdulillah, we have the tools, the bases. And, and the biggest thing is Allah has given us an internal compass that, you know, if we do nourish that and nurture that and focus on the good, a lot of times our defense mechanisms will always focus on what's wrong and what's not. not. And, that, and that's, a, that's a human thing. We want to protect ourselves from hurt. But actually opening ourselves up to and focusing on the good and, and increasing that and nourishing that will actually help with the communication. If you have any. Jazak al and do we have any questions or anything? I was just going to check, but thank you so much um, for your, you know, your final remarks as well, Sabrine. So important. So, so much insight into... Um, communication and barriers and 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 I, you know all these things these emotions that we feel like you know the terms are so relatable right like all the terminology that you're bringing up um you you behave in these ways but you don't know that there's a term given to it you know and um it's 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 quite amazing um just to like I said changing that that mindset being more mindful empathetic um but um it's it's very interesting. I, I mean, I've learned a lot, and I and I share. I'm getting text messages, and I'm seeing on Facebook as well. People are really appreciating what you've had to share today with us. Um, Nizar, do you have any um, kind of closing remarks, or I think you actually, you've been sharing gems throughout. Both of you have, but kind of that 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 final gem where <laughs> I think you know, um, I just want to remind everyone that sometimes we hear all this information and we go into this. I should be doing this. I should be doing that, and we can't all show up. And I know I work on this constantly. We. We, we don't always show up in our best selves, right? Although we, we we wish that we lived our best selves every moment of every day, we don't, the reality is. So be show yourself some grace, but put forth that intention to bring forth your best self, right? And we can, even when a, a communication goes awry, um, it's not that we made a mistake, Put you know, it's important to be able to come back to it and create that kind of relationship and environment that you can come back to your partner and say, you know, listen, I wasn't my best self back then. So can we do a redo and have that conversation? It kind of speaks to when you go silent, right? Understanding that your silence really bugs people and they take it a different way. So it's important for us to just come forth and say, you know what, this is what I need in this moment. And I know you need to discuss it. Let's just give it some time, right? Give me, and, and, closing that loop and communicating, even if you can't communicate your thoughts and feelings, at least you're communicating that I'm not ignoring you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to take care of myself. And then we'll come back to this. And I think that's my, one of the most important things is to really check in with your feelings, know, you know, and, and take care of them. And once you have, then communicate with the other person. Okay. Thank you. We have a question. Um, How do you remember? And I think we've just We've mentioned this. I mean, how do you remember all of this when you um, are in that moment of, of of anger, right? You just, how do you step back and really put these things into perspective in that moment when you are just so mad and so angry? Um, what 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 are what, what what tools? What could you what can you share with us? Um, I you know, it's like good at, <laughs> but um, you know. That is first recognizing I am really angry and I'm not going to be in my best self, right? And removing yourself, whether it is saying I need to step away, whether go. I I remember when my boys were little, I actually walked into the bathroom and said, I need to lock myself in the bathroom and take care of myself before I come in out and deal with this. And, and so acknowledging, yeah, when you're really, really angry, you're not going to be able to remember any of this. Your lift, you know, your, your prefrontal cortex is totally disconnected from, from um, your brainstem. Right. And, and so you're not going to have clear and coherent thought. And I think the most important thing you can do is to walk away mm-hmm. and get to the point of calming down. And very often I hear from teachers and parents that, well, no, we need to address the situation right then. And it's like, no, you really don't. Right, you're not going to be benefiting. You're probably going to do more harm than good. So go away, take care of your emotions, see if you can get to the. And it doesn't mean that you're calm down and make the anger go away. But you, if you can get to the uh, place of, all right, I'm really angry. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not to say that you know whatever happened uh, 
you shouldn't get angry. You can get angry, but just get to a place of, okay, what am I going to do to address this anger? Sorry, yeah. Sabrina. No, no, that was great. I, I think just what you said that, you know, acknowledging that it's, there's anger and it's hard. It's hard to remember all of this stuff when we're angry. Like you said, the prefrontal cortex is disconnecting it and, and to allow ourselves that grace um, and then recognize tools that we can practice um, when we're angry. And, you know, Allah's, uh, in Islam, we have, this, you know, if you're standing, sit down. If you're sitting down, lie down, um, drink a glass of water or something. Um, take time away, walk away, make wudu. For me, um, when I'm angry, I like to go make wudu and, you know, just take time away and just process. Um, process what's making me angry. What What is it about the situation that I am angry about? Is it that I feel like my feelings were dismissed? Is it that I feel like I'm not being heard, I'm not being seen? Is it that I felt disrespected? What What is it exactly that is making me angry? And then, um, processing that and then coming back to it and, and giving yourself that time um you know different things and help different people journaling can help sometimes I journal like this is what I'm feeling I'm angry about this thing and I, I don't know how to do it and you know just when you when you start to process it it really goes down to that deep feeling of okay this this is actually what is making me angry and this is this is what I felt happened and then when coming back to it with your partner, your spouse, or whoever you're angry at it with, it can it can be a more meaningful conversation and a more impactful conversation. Perfect. Thank you so much, both Nazareth and Sabrine Mashada, for this amazing presentation.